been here before or do not know, Evangelist John Van Geldren is our speaker for this week. He has been with us, this is the seventh time you said that uh, uh, we've had him over the years, begin, beginning in uh, 2005. I'm thinking, you know, seven is the number of completion, right? <laughs> it's, it's a divine number. Uh, and uh, just the fact that yesterday was uh, Pentecost, wouldn't it be wonderful to have an outpouring of God's Spirit uh, during our time of meeting together? By the way, we had a wonderful uh, prayer time with a few pastors this morning and really sensed God's presence in the room with us. And uh, so we're just really trusting that the Lord will continue and that we would see a manifestation of his presence in our midst here. He's been in evangelism for quite a few years now and uh, has preached all over the country as well as uh, many nations. Thankful for his ministry. Uh, the books that uh, are written, uh, they're on the table. Most of those he has uh, penned over the years and uh, they'll be a help to you as well as the music. So we're glad to have uh, John and his wife, Mary Lynn, who just uh, sang that special with us for these next few days. Brother, come and share God's word with us. All right, thank you, Pastor. Galatians chapter 3 in your Bibles tonight. Galatians chapter 3, we'll get there in a moment. Let me mention a few books that are over here at the table. One of the earlier books is a book called The Wind of the Spirit. Uh, back in the 1990s, God had disturbed me. As I told you yesterday afternoon, uh, 92, 93, there was an awakening to the power of the Spirit or to grace. And because of that, I began reading all sorts of books on the Spirit for Life, Andrew Murray and uh, A.T. Pearson, many other authors. And a number of the authors kept pointing to the chapters of John 14, 15, and 16. Uh, which is Jesus speaking to the disciples before he goes to the cross and he's telling them that he's leaving but that he's sending the Holy Spirit and what life will be like when the Spirit comes and so I thought well I need to read those chapters so in the early 1999 I began to read uh, John 14 15 and 16 repeatedly I was also reading Acts 1 and 2 so John 14 15 and 16 Jesus talking about life will, what life will be like when the Spirit comes of course, Acts 1 and 2, chapter 2, the Spirit came. There's only 43 days in between those two uh, sections of Scripture. And so I read those five chapters, and I read them. And I read them, and I thought, you know, I don't get it. <laughs> you ever felt that way? I thought, wow, these guys, these authors are saying, you've got to understand what's in these chapters, and I'm just reading it. All I could see was the surface, if that. I just could not see and I was deeply burdened about it, but I kept reading. But uh, sometime in February, I think, uh, I remember telling the Lord, Lord, if you don't open my eyes, I will get passed by. I don't understand. And then I kept reading, and sometime in March, somewhere in the USA, I don't remember where, I pulled into a meeting. In those days, I had a fifth wheel trailer, and I hooked it up, and I was sitting in my rocking chair I have to move in order to think <laughs> and uh, I had my Bible open it was a Saturday evening it was actually in Acts 1 and 2 initially and the Holy Spirit began to pour in light and I remember it was overwhelming because you could see you could see the truth connected to the words you had been reading the words for like three months and uh, uh, quickly as the next couple of days uh, rolled on uh, uh, John 14 15 and 16 just just opened up and I remember it was a very special, it was a, it was a, it was a glorious time. Uh, that opened up Galatians 2.20, which opened up Romans 6, and on and on it goes. Well, uh, that was a special time, and so uh, much of what I learned in those days is uh, encapsulated in this book called The Wind of the Spirit uh, in Personal and Corporate Revival. I would call this an introduction to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Many of the other books on the table take slices of this book and then expand them into much greater detail because you keep learning as you go. Uh, but this would be what I would call an introduction uh, it, uh, to the ministry of the Spirit, starting with the inheritance of the Spirit, uh, what the potential is when He moved in the day you got saved. And then a number of chapters on the filling of the Spirit. That's personal revival. When you're filled with the life of Jesus through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and the final chapters deal with the outpouring of the Spirit. 
Uh, when God fills the atmosphere with his presence, a lot of illustrations of revival in that section of the book. When it comes to the center part of the book, that is expanded into much more detail in this book called The Revived Life. This will be a thorough progression of truth on what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God and know it. Let me ask you a question. Can you be saved and know it? Absolutely. How do you know it? Because of the sure words of God that say when you believe on Jesus, you have eternal life. And so you know it because it says so. That's the primary assurance. It's infallible. It's the infallible word. Well, then, can you be cleansed and know it? Absolutely, based on sure words. So you can, be, can you be filled and know it? Absolutely, based on sure words. So uh, similar to what we're doing this week, uh, this is going into uh, uh, that uh, kind of truth. Uh, this does uh, have a chapter dealing with cleansing. We talked about cleansing yesterday. I'll mention that again and again in a moment when we recap. Uh, but uh, the cleansing power of the blood that my wife just sang about. Uh, there's a chapter on our position in Christ on the throne far above the enemy. And then uh, obviously on the provision of the Spirit uh, to fill us with the life of Christ. How to access that uh, and so on and to apply it in our lives. That's what this book is about. There is a final chapter on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we'll touch on a piece of that tonight. But that chapter goes into great detail on it. Good to see you on a Monday night. I love it. Monday night crowds are, are, are really neat because you're here because you intended to be. <laughs> and uh, I uh, appreciate you taking the effort. <clears throat> I'm glad for all those that are tuning in on live stream. Thank you for joining us. And may the Lord breathe on us tonight. Uh, the Lord promises he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. And uh, if you came hungry tonight, uh, you can expect God to speak to you. Well, yesterday morning, we looked at the righteous reigning, <laughs> Romans chapter 5, that focus on Jesus uh, to access his righteous life. And, uh, and yesterday afternoon, we began to peel back the first layer of truth. Obviously, if there's sin in the way, that blocks the flow of his life. And so there may need to be a fresh encounter with God, as we saw in the life of Jacob, and to put away the the foreign gods, the strange gods, that which hinders the flow of the life of Jesus, and to accept the cleansing power of the blood that he promises. What a marvelous truth. But then we need to move on. God doesn't want us to just know what it is to confess. He wants us to walk in the Spirit. He wants us to be filled with the Spirit, for the Spirit to fill us with the life of Jesus so that we're experiencing the fullness of God. Now again, it's not what you say you believe, it's what you really believe. We need the Spirit of God to take the truth of God and convince us so that instead of wishful thinking, we can exercise faith. So we're going to look at words tonight. We're going to ask the Spirit of God to open our understanding to the truth connected to those words because if you become convinced of this truth, then you can exercise faith for that life stream of Jesus in your heart and life. So Galatians chapter 3 is where we're going to look. In a moment, we'll be in Romans chapter 6. You may want to uh, put a, a marker over there. Uh, but our first point is going to be in Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 26 and 27. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. These are amazing verses. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on, have been clothed with, have been literally endued with Christ. What a verse. You become a child of God, it says in verse 26, how? When you put your faith in Jesus. And when that happens, you're baptized into Christ and you're clothed with Jesus. And that connection, that union of being in him and clothed with him allows then for the potential of experiencing his life on the throne being streamed from the throne right into you right here. So I want to speak tonight on life streaming. Let's pray, and will you join me in prayer, and will you ask the Holy Spirit to open your understanding and be your teacher tonight. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to meet tonight. Thank you for these hungry hearts here. Thank you, Lord, for this church. Now, Lord, breathe on us once again tonight. Oh, Spirit of the living God, 
would you truly be our teacher tonight? Lord, open our eyes and give us clarity. And may we see the grand truth that's connected to these amazing words. Lord, I pray that you would, in that illumination, so convince us that the faith response would be the obvious, natural response. Now, Lord, I plead the victory through the blood of Jesus over the enemy tonight. Lord Jesus, I claim our position in you on the throne far above the enemy, and in your name I exercise your authority over any powers of darkness that would seek to hinder tonight and trust you that that not be allowed. Lord, at all. Lord, knock out Satan's lies tonight. and May the truth explode in our hearts. And may Jesus personify truth be glorified. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I entered evangelism in January 1992, so 30-plus years ago. And, uh, you know, over the years, sometimes you got to move from one section of the country to another section of the country. And uh, occasionally, uh, you've got to several travel days in a row, and sometimes, this is very, very rare, uh, but you have to travel on Sunday. So back in those days, uh, if, uh, that was happening, uh, when it was around 10.30 uh, or so, uh, we would uh, we'd start looking for a church as we're going through a town, and we'd pull over and hope for the best. <laughs> and you never know, <laughs> but uh, those were uh, some amazing experiences. But now, you can just live stream. I remember one time, I think we were on Interstate 40 going across New Mexico. And we were live streaming the service at Ann Arbor Baptist Church. That's my home, home church. And so, you know, there we are on the interstate. I'm driving down the road. <laughs> and uh, uh, occasionally I'm looking over, not, not too much because I look at the road. But, uh, uh, you know, we're watching the service as it takes place. Of course, some are doing that tonight right here. That's marvelous. But, you know, God had this live stream, uh, streaming thing figured out long before man did. In fact, God has it even on a greater dimension and level. It's not just live streaming, it's life streaming. You see, our text makes it clear that when you put your faith in Jesus, when you understood sin is the problem, it takes you to hell, but Jesus is the solution. He is the answer. And when you put your faith in him to apply his saving work on the cross to you once and for all, at that moment, your sins are forgiven. His righteousness is credited to your account, and he moves in. He gives you his very own eternal life. And friends, when that happens, verse 27 makes it clear, something happened, and here's how it's described. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You're in a union. You are in a relationship that allows the life of Jesus from the throne to actually be streamed right into you. And it's not figurative, it's literal. It's just that it's spiritual, not physical. And here's the bottom line. If you're saved, you're joined to Jesus, which means you have the privilege of life streaming the very life of Jesus. Now, how can this be? Wishful thinking will get us nowhere, even if it's nice ideas. We have to be convinced by the Spirit of the words of the living God. So I want us to see tonight from Galatians 3, and then we'll be in Romans 6 here in a moment, three reasons that uh, uh, answer that question of the how. And let's let God's reasoning build our faith tonight so that we, moment by moment, life stream the very life of Jesus. The first reason we're going to see right here in Galatians 3 is that God identifies you. If you're a born-again believer, if you are truly saved, God identifies you with Christ's life. Now, again, it says, for as many of you as have been baptized, immersed into Christ, have put on Christ. In the Word of God, in our New Testaments, uh, some passages that deal with baptism are dealing with water baptism. Other passages are dealing with what we call the baptism of the Spirit or spirit baptism. A lot of times people argue about what's what. Is this passage water baptism or is this passage spirit baptism? And they scratch their heads and wonder and argue. Well, there's a very simple solution to figuring it out. If in the given passage, the person doing the baptizing is a human being, and if the element being baptized into is H2O, then it's water baptism. <laughs> but if the person doing the baptizing is deity, and the element being baptized into is deity, then it is spirit baptism. 
Now, in our text, it says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ. So is this water baptism or spirit baptism? This is spirit baptism. Okay, so what does it say? For as many of you as have been baptized, immersed, submerged into Christ, have put on, been clothed with. The same word is translated in Luke 24. Been endued with Christ. Here's the simplicity. The moment you get saved, you're in Christ, and Christ is in you. If we take a sponge and we submerge it, immerse it, that's what baptism means. If we immerse it into water, as it goes into the water, it's enveloped, it's clothed with the water as the water moves into the sponge. In similar fashion, the moment you put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit immerses you. He submerges you. He baptizes you into Christ. And as you're submerged into Jesus, you're enveloped with Jesus. You're clothed with Jesus. You put on Jesus as he places his spirit right into you. And because of those facts that you're in him and he's in you, you have this amazing connection, this union with Jesus, and thus God identifies you with Christ's life. Second reason tonight. God identifies you with Christ's history. This is the obvious logical follow-up. If you're identified with Christ's life, that means you're identified with his history. But now let's go over to Romans chapter 6 because we're going to uh, highlight a few phrases here in Romans 6 that uh, unfold this, that God identifies you with Christ's history. You're in Christ, and therefore you're placed into his history. And in that history, there are three facts that are pointed out. Two are highlighted here in Romans 6, and one over in Ephesians chapter 2. Well, let's look at these facts. The first one is, you died with Christ. In other words, if you got baptized into Christ, if you're in him, you're in his history, well, therefore you're in his death. Now, don't take my word for it. Look at verse 3. It says, no ye not. Now, whenever the Bible use that, uses that language, it generally means you probably don't know this and you really need to. <laughs> okay, so don't you know that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, here it is, we're baptized into his death. So there's the first fact of his history that the text here is pointing up. When you got saved, you got immersed into Jesus. When you got placed into Jesus, you got placed into his history, and therefore, you got placed into his death. Now, physical death, in physical death, there's a separation. The practical essence of physical death is when your soul separates from your body. For there to be a death, there has to be a separation. So if we're placed into Christ's death, then what did we get separated from? We'll cast your eyes up to verse 2, which is the preceding verse. And it says, How shall we that are dead or who have died to... What's the next word? Sin. And not sins, but sin in the singular. That entity inside of us that urges us to commit sins. What Romans 7 calls sin that dwelleth in me. See, sins in the plural is the emphasis of Romans 1 through 5, justification. But when it switches to sanctification, it switches from the plural, sins, to sin in the singular. Romans 7, 2 times, verse 17 and verse 20 says, Sin which dwelleth in me, I shortened that to simply indwelling sin. It is not sins, it is this something in, in us that urges us to commit sins. Now, when you face a trigger of temptation, have there been times when you feel the pull to cave in? Okay. That Paul is sin in the singular. It is an entity inside of us that prior to salvation we're joined to, but when you get baptized into Jesus, you're baptized into his death, and that's when you died to sin. So we could say it this way. 
you died with Christ unto indwelling sin. We could say it in more detail. Through death with Christ, the old you was severed from the old master of indwelling sin. So let's jump down to verse 6 and see some more detail here. It says, knowing this, that our old man is, literally has been, was crucified with him. Okay, so this helps us out. In Galatians 2.20 it says, I am crucified with Christ. Romans 6.6, 6, a parallel verse, tells us which part of the eye got killed. You see, when it says, I am crucified, somebody got killed. We've got to ask who got killed. Well, Romans 6.6 6 tells us. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Christ. Well, let's figure this out. Again, physical death is when the soul separates from the body. The best I can tell, that has not happened for anyone yet in this audience. <laughs> Don't try it tonight, okay? <laughs> I'd mess up the service. <laughs> but uh, uh, at any rate, that means we're not talking about your body or your soul. Ah, so the old man is the biblical label by implication of the unregenerated human spirit. That's who got killed. The old man. For the women in the audience, the old lady. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. But at any rate, I couldn't resist. So, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. <laughs> you see... Why did this happen? Well, it goes on to say that the body of... Here's that sin in the singular thing. See, this entity called sin, this sin that dwells in us, not sins, but this something in us that pulls us and urges us and influences us to cave in and commit sins, okay? Sin can't sin without a body. And to get more specific, as it does in verse 16 and verse 19, without body parts. Without eyes and ears and a tongue and hands and feet. Okay, so we're crucified with Christ so that the body, which is the turf for the activity of this guy called indwelling sin, might be destroyed. Please don't misunderstand the word. It's not talking about annihilated. It means deprived of its power. So that, next phrase, we should henceforth, we should henceforth, uh, that henceforth we should not serve indwelling sin. See, the old man, your human spirit is personified because of the very language old man, so the human spirit here is personified, but then this sin entity is personified as a master who is served. And the fact of the matter is, prior to salvation, we're joined to that guy. You talk about a, a forgive the term, thinking relation, relationship. That's what this is. The old you, the old real you was joined in a relationship with this old master of indwelling sin. It's as if we're shackled. It's as if we're chained. It's as if we're bonded and stuck to this guy so that everything we do in the unsaved con condition is tainted and defiled by that relationship. Even the best efforts, the noblest efforts, the most uh, kind humanitarian efforts that unsaved people make are done in union with the sin master that taints it and defiles it and makes it a filthy rag that falls short of the glory of God. All of it! And that's why we need salvation in Jesus. And friends, we cannot get out of that relationship on our own. We need Jesus to do it for us. We cannot die to sin on our own. So let your eyes look down a bit further to verse 10, one of the greatest statements, in my opinion, in the New Testament. Verse 10 says, for in that he died, now here it is, he died, that's Jesus died unto sin. Once. Now look, this is not the same truth as 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sins. That's the glorious truth of the gospel to sinners. This is Christ died unto sin. This is the gospel to the saints. Now friends, we're stuck to this guy. And this is the guy that's always urging us to, to, to commit sins. 
and we're bonded to him. We're, we're stuck to this guy. We need to get away from this guy. We're shackled and chained. We can't do it on our own. But it says Jesus died unto sin. Now that means there had to be a time when Jesus came into union with sin. And friends, that's the power of crucifixion day. 12 noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The Gospels tell us that this entire earth went dark. It was the darkest day in human history. At the end of those three hours, Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou, what's the word? Forsaken me. That's pretty strong. What was Jesus saying? Friends, in those hours, Jesus, God the Son, who was functioning as the Son of Man to represent us, was separated, that's the essence of death, from God the Father. Why? Because he was in union with us, with sin. And I believe this is why he agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. I do not believe he was running from the cross. I know many do. I personally don't. He came to save sinners. He wasn't running from that purpose. It was the way of the cross. It was because for the very first time in all of eternity, this perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God, Jesus, the Son of God, but functioning as the Son of Man to represent us, was separated from the Father because he was in an actual contact with sin. One truth is that all the sins of the entire human race were laid on him. All the sins of the race, the very first Adam and Eve to the last human being who will ever live, the sins of the race went on him. That's why he's called the last Adam. Not the second Adam, the last Adam. He's the second man <laughs> who started a new race. But he's the last Adam as he takes the sins of the race on him. But he also came in contact with sin. He became sin for us. And so, thus the agony. But there on the cross, before he voluntarily gave up his spirit, he said, it is, what's the word? Finished. And that's when it says here, he died unto sin once. So think, in the immaterial part of your being and mine, obviously there's our body, that's the external, then there's the soul, and then there's the spirit. That old man, that human spirit was joined. It was in a relationship with this sin master, with indwelling sin. This, this, this master we're stuck to, we're chained to, we can't get away on our own. But Jesus went to the cross, died for our sins, but died unto sin and said, it is finished. And friends, when you put your faith in Jesus, we already saw it in Galatians, at that moment, you're baptized into him. And when you're in Christ, you're in his history, which means you're in his death which means at that moment, that's when the cross comes in and the immaterial part of your being, where your human spirit, the old man, is shackled and joined to this old master of indwelling sin. And the cross comes in like a knife and cuts through every one of those shackles and sets you free. Look at verse 7. That's why it says, For he that is dead, he who has died is freed from what? Indwelling sin. You got set free from that guy. He still hangs around in your soul and body level. That's why you're not perfect. But your spirit, the real you, got set free, liberated, separated, unshackled from a dwelling sin. And that old relationship is over. The severance is permanent. Back in 2009, uh, my wife and I uh, got a house on the foreclosure market of southern Michigan. For years, we just lived out of the fifth wheel uh, because that's, you know, basically what we're doing all the time. Uh, but uh, just how the Lord led. Of course, the economy crashed in uh, 08, and, and uh, houses in Michigan got really cheap uh, because of uh, all that was happening, the auto industry, everybody leaving and so forth. In fact, this is what I'm told. You could buy a house in Detroit for $1. You wouldn't want it, but I'm told that there were houses in Detroit going for a buck. Now, this was not in Detroit, and this was more than a buck, but it was still, you know, a good deal. On the point. It's just how the Lord led. Now, we don't hardly need a house because we're not there much, but this is what the Lord uh, led, and so it's what we did. Well, <laughs> we moved in in December because I had a few weeks off because of the holidays, and uh, we discovered that we were living with squirrels. <laughs> I mean... They were like up in the attic kind of thing. Now, not the gray squirrels that you have here in the city. These are these little red squirrels. 
and you know, I mean they can get in anywhere and oh man and uh, the, the, the house is a two-story house they it has cedar wood eaves and so the squirrels would just chew right through the cedar wood so I'm seeing these holes I'm going oh man so I hire this guy he goes up there he puts all this metal up there puts new wood up well they just chewed hit the metal kept chewing this way until the metal stopped and then they went in now we had a bigger mess <laughs> Well, for several years, I mean, this was just a pain, you know, and they're waking me up in the morning when I'm home too early <laughs> and this kind of stuff and whatever. And uh, uh, we, I won't go into all the detail. We finally got them out of the attic. Uh, but then they got in another spot on the main floor of the house. When you go out the back door, there's actually a deck and there's some woods back there. Uh, and as you go out on the deck, there's a door that goes down into the basement and uh, there's a kind of a... a an angle the roof line there there's some cedar wood there and that's where they went in but at least they were not in the attic so I thought well you know maybe I'll just leave it like it is they're not waking me up now uh, but then we found a dead one in the furnace and I thought you know how far are they penetrating into this house and uh, one time I saw chewed wires and I thought, uh oh now they're gonna burn the house down and so you know I grew up in Chicago so well uh, I'm not a hunter but I became one <laughs> And I declared war on these little red squirrels. So uh, we tried all sorts of things, but finally, I just got so sick of it, my brother-in-law lent me his uh, pellet rifle, 1,250 feet per second. So <laughs> uh, I remember the summer of 2016, we killed 30. You act like you're feeling sorry for the squirrels. You don't even feel sorry for us, okay? Uh, but, uh, I mean, my wife even got into that. I mean, she was like, Elmer Fudd, you know, where's the rabbit? <laughs> uh, my son got one at 50 yards out of a weeping willow. Now, we don't count them unless they fly off. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes one of them flew off and he, and he caught the branch on the way down. And I think I heard him say, I'm too young to die. But then, <laughs> then he let go. And uh, so it was 30 that summer. The next summer, I don't remember what it was. The next summer, it was 26. And so they were getting less and less. But you know, there's a lot of squirrels out in the woods. <laughs> and uh, when we got into, was it 2019, I think, I was pretty sure I had them out. I said, I think we got the right clan. Because <laughs> there's lots of clans. I think we got the right clan. So I didn't want to just plug it up because I didn't want them to go back up to the attic. <clears throat> so I just, I really wanted to know if we, have we got this thing yet. So I just got a, a piece of wood, a, you know, a, a branch and stuck it in the hole uh, because that way, as long as that branch was in the hole, that means they were out here, which is what I wanted. And if that piece of wood, that little branch, if that was ever taken out of the hole, that means they were in. <laughs> so uh, this is my little method, you know. And so I come home after a couple of weeks and that, that, that little piece of wood is still there. Oh, man. We might have licked this thing. And uh, I was out for more meetings, came back, March, I don't know what it was, and that piece of wood is still there, which means they're out in the woods. That's where they're supposed to be. I'm okay with that. And uh, they're not uh, in the house. And I thought, wow, this is great. Well, then I came back in May. That little stick was out, which means they were in. Probably having babies. <laughs> and I thought, oh, man, I am so sick of this. <laughs> So I did what a city kid would do. You know those glue boards that you use to catch mice and, and rats? Well, some of them are like in tubs, but some of them are on a, just a flat board that you gotta fold up. Well, I took one of the flat boards. I said, you know what, they're in for the night. <laughs> I'm just gonna stick that over the hole and they're gonna get a mouthful of glue in the morning. <laughs> now, I didn't really want them stuck in there, but I, you know, I gotta do something. So I just, you know, in the frustration of the moment, I stuck it over the hole. Well, next morning they chewed right through that as if it was nothing. <laughs> I mean, good grief, how did they do that? They're out in the woods laughing at the humans and, and all, all this stuff. I thought, now what am I going to do? And so I thought, well, so I had taken the glue board. It was rectangular, horizontal. I put it this way, uh, you know, so obviously flat down because they had to come through the glue this way. So I thought, well, now they're out here. To come in tonight, they're going to they're gonna climb right up this post. So I stuck another one under the lip of that one that was facing out. So now they got to go over that glue to get in the hole. And then I put one this way, and based on the roof line, I, I knew that they would have to go over that clue. I, I don't know if it'll work. I'll just give it a shot. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting, but they're still out in the woods laughing at him and playing jokes. And So uh, I finally went to bed. Next morning, I pop out there on the porch, and guess what? There's a little red squirrel hanging on that glue board. He'd been there for hours, apparently. Man, when he saw me, he went ballistic, but he couldn't get off. 
I mean, the guy was stuck, like three paws in the tail. <laughs> he is stuck! And I'm looking at him. <laughs> Big smile on my face. And uh, he's looking at me, trying to get off that board. He could not get off. Now, I'm sure he tried uh, uh, earlier in the night, ran out of energy. And then when I came back out, he was ballistic. He could not get off that board. Then I thought to myself, now what am I going to do? I can't just let him die a slow death. You know, that's not right. So um, I took the rifle and put the pellet, and I took care of it at close <laughs> point blank range. Now, when he died, <laughs> he fell off the board. And I'm scratching my head thinking, now, wait a second. He's been on there for hours working his head off <laughs> to get off that board and he couldn't get off. But when he died, he got off. I mean, he was dead. He, he fell off. For the next two days, we got two more the same way. And when they died, they would fall off the board. Now, I don't know if something happened to their skin to let the, the, the fur loose. I don't know. But when they died, they got unstuck. You see the picture? The old man <laughs> is stuck to the old sin master. Try as we may, we're stuck. <laughs> we can't get off. But friends, when you believe on Jesus, you're placed into Jesus. You're placed into his death. And at that moment, you die too in dwelling sin. You get unstuck. You need to know that. You are not chained to that pull. You may still feel that pull. We do. Because uh, he still resides in our soul and body level. But our spirit, the real us, is not connected any longer. We have been set free. That brings us to the next fact. Not only did you die with Christ, you rose with Christ. Look at verse 5. For if we have been planted together in this union through that baptism, in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So if you're placed into his history, therefore you're placed into his death, therefore you're also placed into his resurrection. And through that resurrection with Christ, that old you was raised a new you and is now joined to a new leader, the indwelling Christ himself. In other words, the old man dies with Christ and he's raised the new man. Let me ask you a question. Where's the old man? The old man dies with Christ and is raised the new man. Let me ask you this. Is it possible to have an unregenerated spirit and a regenerated spirit in the same body? Is that possible? No. So the old man is the unregenerated spirit. He dies with Christ. He's raised the new man. Ephesians 4.24. So where's the old man? He's gone. Forever. Now, that sin master, he's still hanging around. That's why we still have problems. But your old man died with Christ, was raised the new man. And we're told in Ephesians 4.24 that the new man is created. So it's not a renovation. It's a new creation. That's 2 Corinthians 5.17. We dealt with it about, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. Uh, the new creature, the new creation, a creative act of God took place. That's the new man which is created after God. Now notice it says, in righteousness and true holiness. That's why God calls you a saint. That's what we talked about yesterday morning. Oh, because that part of you is created after God in righteousness and true holiness. Whoa, why and how? Well, when it says created after God, I love this. Remember, Jesus is the last Adam. He's the second man. He starts a new race. Created after God. 1 John 3, 9 tells us that that part of us is described in 1 John 3, 9 as God's seed. Literally, God's sperma. Do you know that when you're born again, something of God's nature, his DNA is inserted into you. That's the new man. The new lady. <laughs> That's the new you. God's nature. This is why Jesus is called the second man. He starts a new race because his nature is implanted into us. I'm going to tell you, that part of you is not just declared righteous. It is righteous. That's where we ended up at the end of the service Sunday morning. That part is righteous. It's not just declared righteous. It is. It's God's nature. That's 
regeneration. As the Spirit generates the divine nature into you. That's glorious. You see, there had to be a part of you made holy so the Holy Spirit could move in. And this is even the greater truth. You see, we receive Christ's life actually in a twofold sense. His nature is implanted so that His Spirit can indwell. And the Spirit indwells that new you, that new man that's created after God in righteousness and true holiness. That's where the Holy Spirit moves in to lead and empower. And I call him the new leader instead of the new master because though he is the Lord of all, he doesn't force his way. And God could have done whatever he wanted to, but he chose not to force. The old master, you're stuck, you're chained, it was force. Now you're set free from that guy. You're joined to Jesus. He doesn't force you. In fact, if you want to, you can go serve the old master. You and I have done it. And it makes no sense at all because he's not our boss. We got set free from that guy. He said, why doesn't Jesus just force us? Because he doesn't want us to be robots. He wants a love relationship. He wants faith cooperation. Glad surrender. Oh, see, but he's the new leader. And so that old relationship with indwelling sin is forever severed, but the new relationship with the indwelling Christ is forever sealed. And 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. You've been fused to Jesus. And you cannot ever be unfused. <laughs> you can't ever be unsaved once you've been saved. You can't be unborn once you've been born again. And so it's an amazing truth. You know, in our world, things break, and we use super glue and gorilla glue and whatever you know, they come up with, you know. That stuff still doesn't work to me half the time. I don't know what I do wrong, you know. Super glue doesn't work for me. <laughs> but I'll tell you, you got glued to Jesus, and that works. This bond cannot be broken. That's why absent from the body present with the Lord, you're joined. You see, and when you access Him, His life overcomes. It's just like if you're about to drown out here in the bay and somebody throws you that life vest and you put on the life vest and there is that buoyant uh, counteraction uh, where they, the life vest counteracts and overcomes the sinking tendency. When we access Jesus, that's what happens. We'll come more to that here in a moment. So, the first fact is you died with Christ. The second fact is you rose with Christ. The third fact, and I'll just barely touch this, is you ascended with Christ. You don't need to turn there, but this is Ephesians 1 and 2. God displayed His mighty power when He raised Christ from the dead and set Him at His own right hand. That's the throne. Far above all principality and power. See, that's authority. The throne, authority. Chapter 2 says, and you, seated together with Him in that spiritual realm, the heavenly places, in Christ. See, if you're in it, you got placed into his death, you got placed into his resurrection, you got placed even into his ascension. Friends, it's not figurative, it's literal, it's just that it's spiritual, not physical. Physically, we're sitting here in Sheep's Head Bay, right? That's where we're at. Sometimes I gotta figure out where am I at. Sorry, I don't know what I'm doing, call me. I'm somewhere. Uh, uh, because we're in a different place all the time. But, all right, physically, we're right here in Brooklyn. But for every child of God, if you are truly born again, if you're not born again, you need to be big time. But if you're born again, though physically you're here, spiritually you're there. You're in Christ. He's on the throne right now, far above the enemy, which means in Christ, as one lady put it, in Christ we are as far above the power of Satan as Christ is. Man, hallelujah. That means you're above the enemy. You walk in the flesh, you're placing yourself under a defeated foe. You walk in the spirit, now you can war from the throne. See, Satan was defeated at the cross, so it'll be fully manifest in the book of Revelation, but in the spirit dimension, Satan is at a disadvantage because in that dimension, even right now, he's totally defeated. Now, the authority is Christ. He's the head. Ephesians 1 at the end of the chapter. We're the body. It's his authority, but we're the body. We have to exercise it. Now look. This is based on the fact that you're in Him. It's not based on the fact of how long you've been in Him. How long you've been saved. It's not based on how mature you are. It's not based on how long you've been right with God. Now, if you're not right with God, if you're giving place to the devil, then you're not going to be able to have faith, exercise, throne seat authority over the devil. 
But the fact is, you can get right with God, and it's not based on how long you're right with God. Friends, if you're walking in the Spirit, whether you're a brand new Christian or been saved for decades, you can exercise throne seat authority. Uh, Hugo, in his book called Bone of His Bones, uh, he was a missionary in Mexico, but he tells a story uh, of a situation in China where a distraught father came to a Chinese pastor desperate for help because his daughter was demon-possessed. And to his dismay, he found out that that day the pastor was not there. But the teenage son said to the man, I'll go with you. I've seen father do it. I know how. On his way over, he later testified that he made sure he was, had confessed everything that <laughs> might need to be confessed, and he cried out to the Lord for help. That's why I believe this was a teenager. It doesn't actually give his age. It just says it was the son. At any rate, when he got there, here's the demon-possessed girl writhing around on the floor, foaming at the mouth. And we're not used to seeing that. That's what he saw. And he immediately, looking at that girl, spoke the authority of Jesus to the enemy and said in the name of Jesus I say to you go forth and immediately the girl was set free now friends exercising authority over the enemy is not based on how long you've been saved but you got to be saved you got to be in Christ it's not based on how spiritually mature you are it's just based on faith in the one who has all authority so God identifies you with Christ's life Secondly, God identifies you with Christ's history. We saw three facts. His death, that means you're severed from indwelling sin. His resurrection, now you're joined to Jesus. And his ascension to the throne over the enemy. That brings us to the final truth tonight of God's reasoning. Not only does God identify you with Christ's life and his history, God identifies you with Christ's acceptance. I love this. Ephesians 1 verse 6 says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he, is he, made, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved remember the father said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and we're in him see we're accepted in him now friends obviously God wants us to take our provision by faith he wants us to experience the overcoming life of Jesus but our acceptance is not based on how well we take by faith our provision and experience victory our acceptance is because we're in him Wow, did you know that your acceptance is not based on your performance? None of us would be accepted very well if it's based on performance. We're accepted because we're in Christ. See, Satan lies to insist you're not accepted anymore. Man, you blew it. Look at you. Wow, you lost your time. Look what you said. Oh, man, you sound like the sailor over here at the dock. <laughs> You're not accepted anymore. Ever felt that? Oh, look what you just did. Oh, yeah, you and your secret sins in the closet over here. Look at you. You're not accepted. Now, friends, God is grieved by all of those things. When we sin and we cave into our flesh and we ignore our provision, we grieve the Spirit. But it's only somebody who loves us who's grieved. But the fact is we're still accepted. Why? Because we're in Christ. See, Satan lies to us and makes us think that, well, we're not accepted anymore because we had a bad moment. And he wants us to focus on the shame and the guilt that we feel from that worst day. Maybe something you did where you really did make a terrible choice. Or maybe something that was done to you. And in our world of sexual abuse and all of that kind of stuff, this is massive. And Satan plays off of this and makes people think that they are forever identified by the shame and the guilt that they feel from that worst day. When no, you're identified by who you are in Christ, righteous. And that's why you're accepted in the righteous one who measured up for us. And so we're accepted in Christ. And therefore, Romans 5, where we were last uh, morning, says we have access. In whom, Jesus, we have access by faith. See, it's not automatic. The provision is there. But it says we have access by faith, which is not a work. It's just dependence upon the worker. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So let me wrap it up with this. Galatians said, you became a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, and at that moment, you were baptized into Christ, and you put on Christ. It's a done deal. But Romans 13, 14, 
gives a command, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now wait a second. Galatians says you have put on Christ. Romans 13, 14 says, but put on Christ. Do you see it? As a matter of fact, yes, you have put on Christ. But as a matter of function, you have to by faith take your provision or you miss out. See, faith connects the facts with the function. And as we take the provision and claim our God-given right to his life stream from the throne, that's when we experience Jesus. You see, he's, he, the Spirit is streaming the life of Christ into us all the time. He never leaves us. But that flow is blocked when we don't access him by faith. Remember uh, Galatians 2.20, Christ lives in me, dot, 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 by faith. So when there's not faith, though he's still there, we miss out on the experience. We miss out on the benefits, the full benefits of his overcoming life. But when you by faith take the provision that Christ is living in you, being streamed to you from the very throne by the Spirit of the living God, friends, then that life animates your personality and you become a God-filled personality. God-saturated, God-possessed. You see, it's not a matter of your best for God. It's a matter of His best in you. All of him, in all of you, and in all of me. And so let's identify with how God identifies us. Christ's life, his history, death, we're severed from indwelling sin. Resurrection, our spirit is now righteous, the DNA of God, and the Holy Spirit has moved in, and thus we're in Christ on the throne. And we're accepted, which means we can have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord willing, in the next night or two, we will unfold further how to apply this, but you can't apply if you don't believe what is. This is what we need to reckon, Romans 6, 11. This is what we need to allow the Spirit of God to convince us of so that we can yield correctly to the real leader. I wonder who tonight would say, Preacher, God's opening my eyes. You know, I, I, I think I've been on the wishful thinking level of the Spirit for life. When God is convincing me that there is an actual provision that I have actually died to sin, now I see what it means. And that I've been raised a new man, God's nature, God's seed, God's DNA put in me. And the Holy Spirit has moved in, streaming the life of Jesus into me. These are all facts of provision that can be taken by faith. I wonder who would say, Preacher, God is nurturing my faith because I haven't, uh, haven't really grabbed a hold of, of what is. And God's opening my eyes to what is so that I can take it. And I'll give that testimony tonight. Would you raise the hand, please? Yes, amen. Yes, yes, amen. God bless you. Yes. Now, friends, let's thank the Lord for what he says is so, because it is so. Now, Lord willing, tomorrow we'll be, begin to apply it. Before I close in prayer here, let me ask this. I wonder who would say, Preacher, I'm not even saved. You talked about this, this being saved and you're baptized into Christ and you put on Christ and all this, all this massive stuff starts happening. Friend, are you saved? Are you in Christ? I wonder who tonight would say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I know it, and God's speaking to me. I need to get saved. Would you raise the hand, please? If that's you, would you raise the hand? I'm not going to point you out or make a scene, but I would like to pray for you. Who would say, Preacher, that is me. I don't know that my sins are yet forgiven, that I've been placed into Christ, that he has moved into me. I don't know that yet. Please pray for me. Anyone at all? Now, Lord, I pray that you'll bless in these final moments. And, Lord, may we rejoice in the facts of being in Christ. His death, his resurrection, his position on the throne above the enemy. Lord, we thank you that we are accepted in you. Lord, I pray, take this beyond what we say we believe. So convince us that we really believe. So that we then walk by faith. 
We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.